Thank you. We praise you. And we pray again, Lord, that you would speak to us and that you would just be present among us. That we would be encouraged and that we would be challenged. All in your name. We thank you and praise the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So, um, what was yesterday? You guys know what yesterday was? It was kind of a big deal for Korea. Independence Day, right? It, it, it commemorates when when uh, Korea was liberated from Japanese occupation, but at the same time, it also kind of commemorates the start of the Korean War in many ways. It's kind of a bittersweet day um, because we're independent, but we're not unified. Um, so that type of division, I just want you to keep in the back of your heads. It's going to touch a little bit on, on what we're going to be talking about today. So. Um, Um, so, the first thing I wanted to ask you guys today is, anyway, <laughs> there you go. So, do you guys happen to know what the dreams of your parents were? I'm curious. Now, the funny thing was, my parents told me they were going to come today, um, which always happens whenever I use my dad as part of a sermon illustration, he shows up. I don't really know, like, I don't tell him, he just shows up. But oddly, they're not here, so that's, that's good. So what were the dreams of your parents? <laughs> you guys know? Throw something out there if you guys know. What did your parents want to do when they were young and when they were growing up? What were some of their dreams and aspirations? Uh, my mother had a plan to go abroad. Okay. But then... Uh, so she never left Germany? Well, not, not really, I mean, on a long time, besides holidays. Oh. Because she met my father just before she wanted to go abroad. Oh, you know what happens. You get married, it's game over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tommy's mom wanted to, to live abroad, Canada. never got to do so. Oh, Canada, wanted to live in Canada. I don't know why, but I'm okay. <laughs> Anyone else? You guys happen to know the dreams and aspirations of your parents? My mother wanted to be a flight attendant. Oh. So when, she, when she turned 48, she got a job as a flight attendant. Oh, wow. And wow. retired 10 years later. Wow, so she started, she was able to achieve her dream. Right. Okay, but like, wow. she wanted to be a flight attendant from like way back when though, right? Yes. Wow. Never heard of a 40-year-old, 48-year-old becoming a flight attendant. Well, haven't heard yet. That would never happen to you. Okay. Anything else? Just curious. Architect. Architect? She became an engineer. That's good enough. <laughs> Engineers are better than architects. <laughs> There's a rivalry at my school. It's called Dragon Day. The architects try to prove that they're better, and they're not. <laughs> anyway, so, I just want you to have this in the back of your head because I think for many of us growing up, we kind of forget our parents are people, right? And we forget that. Like us, they might have had dreams and aspirations, and for some of us, we are parents now. And so, you know, we had some some of the kids are in the room. Actually, it's kind of funny. <laughs> but, but but you know, if you really think about it, you know, you have these generations that have dreams and aspirations, and we're going to touch upon how many times those dreams are actually fulfilled later on in the generations. Right? Well, we'll talk about that later. So, Genesis 42. I'm going to read the whole chapter, <coughs> buckle up, open your Bibles, or look at the screen above. Genesis 42, word there says this. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us, so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others, because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not rec recognize him. Then he remembered his dream about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to, s to see where our land is unprotected. 
No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. <coughs> Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men... Let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words might, may be verified, and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the, the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them, uh, understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other trembling and said, What is this that God has done to us? When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to him. They said, the, the man who is lord over the land spoke harshly to us and treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, we are honest men, we are not spies. We were twelve brothers, sons of one father. One is no more, and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. Then the man who is lord over the land said to us, this is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, and take food for your starving households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me, so I will know that you are not spies, but honest men. Then I will give your brother back to you, and you can trade in the land. As they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. Their father Jacob said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. Then Reuben said to his father, You may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. All right. So. We are continuing our series. Um, you know, we started with 1 Corinthians for the first six months. We've, we've gone into the story of Joseph, and we are really looking in terms of how God is speaking to us to how to live our lives in the culture, the times that we're in today. Now, this is a bit of a departure. Um, now, now like, as I've said before, when we, when we go through the story of Joseph, you know, we, we started off with an understanding of how the situation he was in was not really due to himself. There was generations of sin before him that, that caused the division in his family, that caused his brothers to hate him. Granted, he helped that by being very arrogant. Um, but then there were generational blessings that helped him as he lived a life of 13 years as a slave. But even during that time of hardship, he continued to achieve success because of the favor of God in his life. That was a blessing that had been passed down from the generations above. Today... We're going to talk about generational fulfillment and really how promises, dreams, and aspirations that were given in previous generations are often fulfilled later on. Okay? So keep that in the back of your head. We're going to be talking, because really the story isn't just about Joseph, it's actually just as importantly about Jacob. Okay? 
And so keep that in the back of mind, everyone. We're talking about multiple generations here. Now, we've been on the story of, of Joseph for a long time. We've been stuck in Egypt for a long time. Now, what, we, what we've been told is, you know, Joseph was a slave for seven or 13 years. He now has become the ruler of, of Egypt. And 20 years total has passed since he was sold as a slave. Okay? Probably a little bit more than 20 years. But now we're finally seeing what things are like back home. And they are not very good. Jacob is very angry. Um, actually, before we get to that, just from the first couple of verses, it shows a very interesting progression. When it talks about his brothers, it describes them three different ways. In verse 1, it talks about them as sons of Jacob. Verse 3, brothers of Joseph. And verse 5, sons of Israel. And so what we're seeing is, just in this very quick progression, we're reminded whose sons they are. We're reminded that, that Joseph has been disconnected from them for 20 years. But we're also reminded of the promise God had given actually way back to Abraham. That in naming Jacob Israel, he was changing the destiny of that family. And he was birthing that, that first promise of, of making a nation out of Abraham's descendants. Right? So we are being reminded of promises that still haven't been fulfilled. And this is spanning hundreds of years. And then we're, we're fast forwarding into this time of difficulty. This is a widespread famine that is going across many different lands and even in Canaan. And these are the, you know, these sons of Jacob are powerless. <laughs> So much so that their own father says, why do you keep looking at each other? Right? You're not doing anything. You're not helping the situation. We are starving and you guys are just sitting around. What are you doing? You can sense his frustration. You can sense that he is not satisfied with, with how things are going and he's definitely not satisfied with his own sons. Now bear in mind, Jacob is, is a grandpa at this point. He's a Adobuji, right? So his sons have sons. Right? But he's still treating them like children. <laughs> and, and you can see that even though his sons have their own family, his, his word still carries weight. Right? So yeah, remember, this is an old man who's actually not too far away from passing away, who's, who's very angry at his mature sons who haven't really turned out right. Okay? Now, as I said before, things have turned around. Joseph went from being that favorite son that was sold into slavery to living a slave for 13 years to now being the ruler of Egypt. Right? He goes from being nobody to actually basically being a king himself, almost. And now his brothers come to him, bowing down, asking for food. Right? Crazy story. Like, crazy turnaround of events. And the reason why they don't recognize him is that, as an Egyptian now, he's very clean-shaven. Um, you know, Jews like to have lots of hair, so all his hair is gone. Um, he's probably, I don't know, possibly darker skinned at this point. But, but, but regardless, they can't, they can't recognize him, and there's good reason for that. He's speaking in the Egyptian tongue, even though he understands Hebrew. He's speaking through an interpreter. But he remembers the dreams that got him into trouble in the first place. He remembers the dreams way back a couple chapters where the, the, the stars were bowing down. The Eleven stars, his eleven brothers were bowing down to him. The sun and the moon, his parents, were bowing down to him. And he sees this before his very eyes when ten of his brothers are there. But he notices that one isn't there. And so this type of event... Honestly, this doesn't happen by itself, right? This is what you call a God-orchestrated event. A turnaround where, where things actually go back complete 180, so much so that what he had been seen, what he saw in dreams, came to reality, right? And I, I know many of you, maybe to a lesser extent, have experienced what we call God-orchestrated events. Things happen in such a way you know that only God could have made it happen. And this is what's going on right now. Now, in terms of what's going to play out, this, this is a very long drama that goes. There's, there's three different visits to Egypt. Um, there's, you know, things going on with silver and stuff. I, honestly, I can't speak to Joseph's motivations themselves. 
you know, I, I, well, why he does certain things, I can't explain to you why, but I can explain to you how God uses these events, right? You know, putting his own brothers in jail, you know, maybe he was getting some revenge, I don't know. <laughs> you, know the, you know, his brothers, you know, he's like, this is what I experienced for 13 years, you get three days, right? Um, I, I, I don't know. Um... Now remember, three days is a very important thing. Obviously, as Christians, we know that from, from the story of Jesus, but three days comes up again and again in the Old Testament. And there's a reason why even the disciples knew that three days was significant to when Jesus died. Regardless, um, they're given a small taste of what he experienced. And you can see that their encounter with Joseph shakes them so much that it reminds them of what they did to their own brother. This is something that 20 years have passed. They have probably tried to forget about what they did. And it's thrown back right in their face. And so, at the same time, Joseph isn't completely heartless. He still has a good heart. He changes his mind. Instead of, of wanting to send um, just one brother and knowing the effect that would have on his father, he decides to send everyone back except for one. He gives them the food. He, he gives them their money back. This is one of the question marks is... Why did he give them their money back? Because it actually gives them a lot of grief. Because they're, they, it really confuses them. They're like, "Why is our money here?" He's, you know, like, it, it's it's one of the things I can't really explain, but it creates a tension in the story. That all of a sudden, all the brothers are freaking out because they know something strange is going on, right? But Joseph still shows compassion because he still cares about his family. But in verse 21, we're actually able to see what we didn't see when he was sold as a slave. When Joseph was sold as a slave, the Bible was very silent on what Joseph was going through. It just talks about it. You see no expression from Joseph. You see him not even fighting back. It almost seems like he just gave himself up. But we see in verse 21 that he was pleading with them. He didn't go down easy. He didn't want to die. He didn't want to be sold as a slave. He was pleading with his brothers, and they didn't listen to him. So we're able to see more of the emotions that are at play as they're, they're unfolding in this text. And we also see that what Joseph does in these next couple of chapters, it's very difficult for him. He keeps running away and crying and coming back. <laughs> right? He does that three times throughout the story. This is not an easy thing for him. But for whatever reason, he's compelled to act in this way. Now... One of the main things that we're going to see throughout the story is, I mentioned this before, is that the three eldest sons had already failed. Reuben is the eldest son, right? He failed before when, um, you know, he basically slept with one of his father's wives. He's not a, not a good, not a bright kid. Um, but regardless, he continues to fail. You see in verse 22, he basically passes the blame. When, they, when, when jo Joseph says, you need to keep one here, Naturally, it should have fallen on Reuben as the eldest. But he's the first to speak up and say, you guys were the ones who, who didn't listen to me. And so he's passing the blame. You see with Reuben that he's not willing to take leadership of, of, of the family. And you even see at the end of the, the chapter, it's ridiculous. When, when he's going to his father Jacob, he's like, Jacob, this is what we got to do. And I will put my son's lives on the line. What is that? <laughs> like... What grandfather would be like, okay, I will kill my grandchildren <laughs> because of the promise that you can't keep? Like, who does something like that? He doesn't even put his life on the line. He puts his children's lives on the line. This is a sign of a coward. And you see in, a, in the later chapter, Judah is the one who steps up. Judah is the one who says, I will put my life on the line. I will make sure that Benjamin comes back safely. And as I mentioned before, that is why Judah becomes the line of kings. Because Judah takes leadership of this family, not Joseph, interestingly enough. Anyway, what I really want to focus on is Jacob. Jacob is not a happy man. You see this in this verse. You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. You can just see the frustration of an old man that is just so discouraged and just, he doesn't want to listen to his sons. 
He's sick of it. And he continues, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the, to the grave in sorrow. You see by his use of, of uh, you know, the, these pronouns and, and adjectives that he's distancing the brothers as far away from Benjamin and Joseph. And he's, he's saying, I don't trust you guys. I don't think you guys can figure this out. And so the, the question I have to ask when I look at, at his frustration is he's getting near the end of his life. And he must be asking himself, all this hardship that I've gone through, was this all worth it? Because you have to understand that Jacob lived at least half of his life running away in fear. He was spending his early years running away from Esau. He thought Esau was going to kill him. He, he, he then he, he hangs out with Laban, and then he runs away from Laban. He thinks Laban's going to kill him. And then all of a sudden, he thinks Esau's going to kill him again. Finally, there's reconciliation. And during this time, he has two amazing encounters. He has that dream where he sees, he sees Jacob's ladder, the ladder going to heaven. And he sees these angels going up and down. And he also has that encounter with God where he, he wrestles with God all night, doesn't give up, and is given the name Israel. Right? Jacob has had amazing experiences and very difficult trying experiences, and now toward the end of his life, he must be asking himself, what was the point of all this? Look at my, look at my children. These guys are worthless. I can't trust them. They're the, the children that I love... They're, they're, they're throwing into slavery, or actually, he doesn't know. He's like, I'm losing the children that I love, the ones that I don't care about. These are the only ones left. <laughs> what, what's the point of all this? That's what Jacob was going through. So the interesting thing is that when you look at the story of Jacob, it's not just his life that is being redeemed. When he is redeemed, it's also redeeming his father's failures. Right? This is a generational fulfillment. This is not just God answering this, the, the requests of one individual. It's God actually combining multiple things at once that are spanning generations. And that's the story of Joseph. You can't separate Joseph from Jacob because both things are happening simultaneously. So, for our particular audience, I think we have people that are in both situations. So are you a Joseph or are you a Jacob? What I mean by that, for a Joseph, are you in a situation where you can actually be the fulfiller of the generational promises? Or as a Jacob, are you someone that's getting frustrated and not seeing the fruit of the, of the things that you have labored for and are wondering, what is the point of all this? And are getting just frustrated with the situation that you're finding yourself in right now. I think in, the, in this room, we have both things going on. We have people that God is placing into positions where they can redeem the family. And God is also having some of us that are in situations but we're not seeing where God is leading our family anymore. And we're not really sure what's going to happen next. Now, thankfully, my, my parents aren't here. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to speak just a, a little bit briefly in terms of, of what I've experienced in this myself. Now, now for my own, my own family, um, most of you guys know, like, you know, my, my dad's side, they're the holy side of the family. You know, my, my uncle's a founding pastor of this church. Um, I have another uncle that's a charismatic pastor, um, who I call Hallelujah Hong. Um, granted, there's, just a, there's a lot of heritage that I have on my father's side. So much so that when people find out who, you know, what family I come from, they're like, oh, you're like Christian royalty. Um, but the thing is, we're, just, we're a normal family like everyone else. We have problems. That charismatic uncle that I was talking about, he was basically kicked out of the family for 15 years. No one talked to him for, for 15 years. It was a very complicated situation. Part of it had to do with him becoming charismatic. 
for 15 years, no one talked to him. And they were reconciled, I think, about eight or nine years ago. And so even within this, this holy family, we had our own issues that we were dealing with. You know, there were brokenness in our relationships. There was brokenness in, in marriages. Those are things that we deal with. No family is perfect. Every family has issues that it is struggling through. And you see it passing on to the generation. You know, I've talked about my uncle who planted this church. And I talked, I've talked about some of the difficulties his son had. Or his sons have had. And just dealing with, with having this Christian celebrity father who they never saw. And so, it, it, it's rather interesting because, um, you know, the funny thing is, what, what I'm hearing recently is that everyone actually thought my father was going to be the pastor from our family, not my uncle that planted this church. Apparently, my, my uncle that planted this church was a bit of a playboy. <laughs> he's a good looking guy <laughs> and apparently he's popular with the ladies but anyway um, don't, don't tell him I said that <laughs> but, but regardless no one expected him to be the pastor my dad was supposed to be the one and so everyone was expecting my dad to, to be the you know the home moksa right and then my dad for whatever reason decided he had he had a decision to make my, my eldest sister had just been born and he had a decision and this was after he had served with campus crusade for three years he planted the campus crusade in Jeju right so he he did a lot of work as a staff member and he had a decision would he go into ministry or would he go to the Golden Gates of America and plant a future for his family and for whatever reason he chose to go to America but I remember growing up, he would always talk about, with regret, not becoming a pastor. And I could always sense that there was always that question, why did I not make that decision? Why did I choose this path? And the funny thing is, I didn't realize how much this bothered my father until I came to Korea. Where this random person at my uncle's other church comes up to me, I don't even know who this guy is. He's like, oh yeah, I'm a friend of your father, blah, blah, blah. He's like, tell me all these stories. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> and then he's like, you know what? It wasn't until you told your father that you wanted to become a pastor that he felt his life was vindicated. Because up until that point, my dad was in a situation like Jacob where, where he had gone through all these hardships. He didn't get to do the things that he wanted to do. My dad loved ministry, never got to do it the way he wanted to. He looked at us, he's like, what are these kids? <laughs> what are they doing? And then, you know, he was like, okay, I'll become a missionary. But I, there was always that, that twinge of, of regret. And apparently this guy told me, when you told him that you were called to become a pastor, he finally felt his life had all made sense and it was all worth it. My dad has never told me this, even today. But I heard it from somebody else. <laughs> so typical. <laughs> But that's what I saw, was that for me, in, in receiving my calling and in, and in choosing to, to fulfill that, that promise, that was my dad's dream. God was using me to fulfill the dreams of my father. And it's really interesting because within my family, it's actually, there's a parallel because Let's see, my, um, I'm a fourth generation believer. My great grandma was the first believer in our family, right? So about 100 years ago. She used to pray for my uncle to become the pastor every single day. My grandfather, my Haraboji, he was the one that wanted to be a pastor, right? He tried to be a pastor. It didn't work to fail. He ended up becoming a businessman instead. But there was always that regret in his heart. Like, why didn't I follow ministry? And like, so actually, the awesome thing is when I got ordained, my, my uncle came and he spoke in my ordination. I didn't understand a lot of it because I'm Korean. But um, one of the stories he told was he talked about how, how it was late in the night, the night of ordination, both him and my, fa my grandfather couldn't fall asleep. And they lived in a huge house. Like, their house back in Hong Kong was... 
like, I don't know, it's ginormous. Like, you could be on the other side of the house and not know someone else is over there, right? But for some reason, they were on extreme sides, and they came toward the center and met. Which, which I guess was a big deal. My, my uncle made me deal with this. Um, and, and, and they talked about it. Like, that, my, 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 um, my grandfather gave my, my, uh, my uncle advice about how to be a pastor. But what was spoken to me through that was, my uncle was able to do what my grandfather wasn't, and it was his grandmother that was praying for him. In the same way, my grandma was the one praying for me to be the next homo. I've known that ever since I was a kid. She would tell me straight up, you're going to be the next homo. I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't want to do that. And then in many ways, just like my uncle fulfilled the dreams of my grandfather, in many ways, I feel God is, is allowing me to fulfill the promises that he made to my father. And in all honesty, I don't think it's any coincidence that God brought me specifically to this church that my uncle planted. And so for me, it's, it's very easy for me to see how I fit in, in being part of a, of a generational fulfillment. That God is using me not just for my dreams, for the dreams of those before me. That's what the story of Joseph is. God was using Joseph to fulfill the promises that Jacob had been given many, many years ago. And not even him, all the way back to Abraham. Generations before. And so for those of us in this room, whether you are a Jacob or a Joseph, whether you are being put into a position to be a fulfiller or where you are in a position where you are getting frustrated, press on. Don't lose hope. Joseph himself, his story wasn't a simple story. 13 years of slavery. He went through all sorts of hardship before he was able to fulfill even his own dreams. So there's a need for us to not lose hope. That the God who promises, He will always deliver. It just Sometimes it takes a long time. But one of the things I want us to remember, because I really want you to, to take some time to, to think about your family and to think about how God has, has used your family. For some of you that are first generation believers, it's a little bit different because, you know, your family might not have a relationship with God. But for us in this story, God used famine across many different nations to bring a family together. If he would do that for the sake of reuniting family, what would he do for you? So I want you all to understand that no matter what difficulties there might be among the generations in your family, God is greater than and he will stop at nothing to bring about reconciliation and resolution. So the challenge for us is to step forth to be generational redeemers. And to be willing to accept those challenges and to step in a place where we can fulfill the dreams of not only ourselves, but our fathers and mothers, our grandfathers, our grandmothers, and so on. That is the calling that we have. So let's take a moment to just pray into this. I want you to just take a good amount of time to just think about your family. Right? Well, what are some of the, the things in your family that, that lie unresolved? You know, for those of you that have family members that aren't yet believers, that, that's an obvious thing to focus on. But you know, even so, even for those of us that have families that are very much churchgoers, let's really just pray into for God to reveal to us what are these generational promises that have not yet fulfilled in our families. And how does God desire to use us to bring redemption? Whether we are a Joseph or a Jacob, whether we are in the position to redeem or whether we're in the position where we're getting frustrated with God, let's just pray that God would reveal these things and that we would not lose hope. Let's take a moment to pray into this right now. Let's pray.
remind us right now, bring revelation into our hearts and our minds to see, Lord, how you have worked in our families in the past, what promises and dreams you've placed in the generations before us. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to see where we fit, Lord. Lord, whether we are Joseph or Jacob, I just pray, Lord, that that we would press on that we would know that you are our God who fulfills promises who brings redemption so help us to be active in, in seeking to be generational redeemers in our families give us that insight and that heart Lord to not just look upon our own needs our own desires Jesus. 